As we gather today, let's start with some time in this quiet place in the old center cemetery to look around at those whose graves are marked here from almost 300 years ago. Let us remember those who came before us. And let us also think of those whose lives continue to be violently taken over the past year by an oppressive system which turns policing into militarizing and makes many people, especially black and brown people in our society, feel much less safe. Let's call on the power of those who came before us as we stand here to recognize the disparities in our society which left only one gravestone, that of Bristow, to represent the 77 people enslaved in this town. We hope this information held by this community helps us face the inequality, cruelty, oppression, and conflict of slavery, which was foundational in the building of this town. The Witness Stone's West Hartford Project works to humanize those who were enslaved here by documenting the names, the lives, and the stories of the individuals that lived here between 1693 and 1820. The project seeks to honor the humanity, the agency, and the resistance as well of those who were enslaved by naming their names and telling their stories. Our research and our work amplifying the stories of the 15 people we studied this year, we believe is helping to build a stronger community by getting to the truth of what happened in the past. This year we worked virtually with three high school U.S. history classes uh, at KO, Kingswood Oxford. We worked with eight eighth grade, pub, eighth grade public school classes at Sedgwick, KP, Bristow, the virtual middle school, a virtual high school U.S. history class with English language learners, and finally, a middle school class at Solomon Schechter Day School. Kids were great. Community members participated in uh, two four-week sessions in March and April to learn about Frank, Chloe, and Ransom. Thanks to all who participated and helped build community knowledge and capacity. Many of us gathered soil up on Albany Avenue near the reservoir to feel, to feel a connection to the land on which enslaved people who had been forced to toil and live, and we filled jars with soil that you'll see on the table. We hope when people see these jars, they will remember to think about the enslaved people who, in part, built this town. A week ago, four students testified before the town council to get a street renamed after an enslaved person. Of over the 600 streets in this town, not one is named after someone who was enslaved. The town council that night approved the procedure for honorary and historic renaming of public streets. The next step will be a formal application and 100 signatures of support. We hope to rename New Street at Blueback Square with the name of one of the enslaved people we honor today. In the protest against police brutality, some of the chants include, say his name, George Floyd. In some ways, we're going back in time to say their name and be sure that those enslaved here are recognized. You can see the 22 stones already laid in the ground, and today we're going to add 15 more. By, by naming their names and telling their stories, we honor their humanity, their agency, and resistance. This Juneteenth, we will remember those who heard in 1865 on this day that they were free. Here, we go back to the late 1700s, 80 years before that, in West, the West Division of Hartford, and we remember those who gained their freedom here. They defined and lived lives of freedom at the same time that those fighting the British were defining freedom. Each shared an understanding of that concept, and each were defining this new nation. So that's, that's Curtis there. I'm Gerard. We are both from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so, talking about the music, we have to talk about the instrument that is used because this, is, this instrument we're playing here is called a djembe drum. And as we talk about ancestors, this is how, the, what the ancestors used to use to pass time. So when we were playing, what, what we do, we do a drum call and that is used to you, let people know something is about to happen or is happening. Now, this ancient instrument is also alive. There are three stages to the drum. People think it's just a drum, right? But it is a life also. One of the stages is skin that came from the animal, which is one life into the next. The body or shell, which came from the tree and the person that plays it. It formed that trinity. 
it speaks our pain, our hope, and our desire wherever we are in the diaspora. The drum live. Let us show you how. This song is really referring to, even though you're not in Africa, we are bringing Africa to you. Ashe. So you say, Ashe, so be it. Thank you so much. This, uh, this group will actually be leading you out of the cemetery toward the town hall for the rest of the festivities. So now we're going to begin placing our stones. We invited students and community members to read a brief description of each individual whose stone will be placed today. Some of our speakers will also share poetry or reflections. So let us begin with Mayor Cantor. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. This is a wonderful, wonderful gathering of people. Uh, this is a really important day. I actually have an official proclamation uh, to read, uh, but I, I want to also say hi to Tracy and, and give her a thanks and tell her that we are all thinking about her for her incredible work and contributions and her spirit. So let's all give it. <laughs> Teachers can be such an inspiration, and Liz is one of those people. And again, we are so grateful for Liz's teachings and uh, her her uh, coaching and her really letting students spread their wings and fly into this world and make a big difference. So thank you, Liz. I'm gonna... and, th and thank you to Denise, too, for being the, that team member and communicating with us and letting us know the importance of your work. I also want to thank the First Church in Noah Webster House. Without this, the pro this project would not have been possible. The Witness Stone Project, as described by Ms. Devine, is modeled after the Stolperstein stumbling stones that commemorate those who died in the Holocaust, over 70,000 stones in 22 countries across Europe. Um, I have seen them myself, and they are compelling and tell the story uh, and tell and, and compel us to tell the stories of those that are lost, that painful, dark times in our histories that we have to reckon with. Um, and face and learn about. I want to thank all the supporters of this project and my friend Jane and Matt. Thank you so much for your incredible support. Booker, for your guidance and your, your, you know, your research and your care. Uh, we are a better community because of, because of you. Before I read the official proclamation, I'll close by saying thank you for the dedication of the teachers, but really the students, the students who presented before us and the students who do this research because it's the students' teachings that really are compelling us to do better and be better. Thank you to all who have participated in the project. Uh, and so the official proclamation, whereas the town of West Hartford is learning about the recently discovered painful history of the individuals that were once enslaved in this town. This research teaches us that the foundations that built this town included enslaved individuals. We recognize these individuals on this June 19th, 
2021, known as Juneteenth, now a national holiday, yes, which marks the day in 1865 that the last enslaved people of our country, actually was in the Confederate uh, states, were informed of their freedom after signing the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. Whereas we affirm their freedom from the chains of invisibility and bondage and forever recognize their agency, human rights, and contribution to our town and fully condemn the actions of those individuals who chose to enslave other human beings. Whereas the hard work and countless hours of effort to the Witness Stones West Hartford project initiated in 2018 under the auspices of the Noel Webster House and the many students and community members of West Hartford who had dedicated their time and have helped us to tell the individual stories of the 20 two enslaved or 23, I don't, I hope, I think it's, I have 23 enslaved and I'll correct that if it's wrong, enslaved people, including the story of Bristow. Whereas the town of West Hartford is forever committed to recognizing the descendants of the individuals and their contribution to our town, many of whom died without the title of a free person they so richly deserved, and fully acknowledge, respect, and recognize their agency as free human beings, and further recognize through the intentions of the Emancipation Proclamation. Whereas the town of West Hartford is forever indebted to the individuals listed below and recognize that its foundation was built by these individuals that have been identified and many others who died with their names yet to be discovered. Simone, Caesar, Lyde, Paige, Ben, Dinah, Hannah, Kofi, Sarah, uh, Greenville, oh, Kofi, Peter, Pompey, Jack, Sind, Ned, Ben, Reuben, Prout, Boy, Jack, Chris, Greenfield, Kate, Lou, Caesar, Child of Lou, Jude, Prime, Prince, Amboy, Bristow, George, Frank, London, Myla, Mary, Lil, Peg's Child, Widow of Jude, Lemon, Nelson, Tony, Harvey, William, Amos, Wright, Aaron, Peg, Peleg, Knott, John Anderson and all who we work to recognize and discover. Now therefore be it proclaimed that on behalf of the town council and the residents of West Hartford, I, Mayor Sherry G. Cantor, do hereby recognize and commemorate Juneteenth in the town of West Hartford and remember the enslaved individuals of this town and throughout our country and remember those who were last informed of their freedom in, in, on June 19, 1865. And now, I will lay the first stone for the infant. Thank you. Thank you. Today I will place the stone of our youngest person, an infant born on November 6, 1766. The child died five weeks later on December 13, 1766. They lived in an enslaved community with their mother and eight other enslaved people. This child's mother was enslaved by John and Jerusha Whiting, who lived on North Main Street. We wonder, what name did this infant's parents give to this person? We wonder, who knew the exact dates of birth and death to record in the church records? We wonder, what caused this child's death? We wonder what type of burial service did this child's parents have. We think about them today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name is Kyle Erickson. I, I teach here in town. Um, I did not write what you were about to hear. My wonderful and talented student, Rose Preet Cower, did. Um, and the poem is about the enslaved person, Sam. Stories and stories, untold for years and years. Society is the cause due to its racially biased fear. You were enslaved by Thomas Seymour. You were valued at 30 pounds. You were given a bedstand no better than the floor. You weren't mentioned beyond your enslavement like history didn't know you anymore. You lived in the West Division, Four Mile Hill. You were listed on inventories, animal husbandry, most likely your skill. There is much we do not know about you, like when you were born and whether those chains of slavery were torn. We do, what we do know is that you are Sam, you are remembered, you are dehumanized, 
but we together, we help recognize you and others' untold stories. We will work together to learn from those stories. We will work together to spread the message that freedom is for all, not just for the privileged. Good morning. Happy Juneteenth. It's wonderful to gather together this morning to honor and to give voice to those who weren't always in a place where they could use their voice. I'm so grateful to Dr. Tracy Wilson and Liz Devine and now Denise DeMello who began the Witness Stones project here in West Hartford in 2017. Tracy asked me to speak about the impact of this project on the town and she also gave me a, li a limit. She said about two minutes, <laughs> so, so I'll be very brief. I love West Hartford. It's a terrific place to live. And I am so happy to have the opportunity to represent West Hartford. We speak with pride when we talk about the variety of languages in our schools. We have over 60 languages. And we speak with, with pride when we say, look at our town. As you go to the center, it's full of diversity. Still, as wonderful as West Hartford is, it is a town like so many other towns that has a hidden history. We seldom learn in our educational experience, nor is it commonly discussed around town that many of the prominent streets and buildings, such as Whiting, as in Whiting Lane Elementary School, and Sedgwick, were named after early enslavers. While they may have contributed significantly to this town, they were also beneficiaries of free labor by the enslaved people who were forced to support them. While we know the names of these prominent individuals, the full history has not been shared. We know little to nothing about the enslaved. The Witness Stones Project reveals a difficult but important part of our history. Through the Witness Stones Project, we learn that enslaved individuals in West Hartford were simply listed in the inventory of their owner's possessions, just as you mentioned in that poem. They were objects listed amongst household items or animals. What we learned through this project, though, is that the enslaved individuals wanted to be free. They wanted to be landowners and homeowners. They had agency, and some were able to make such achievements. Bristow, who was formerly enslaved by Thomas Hart Hooker, is such an example. Today, we have a middle school, Bristow, that is named in his honor. Many thanks to Booker Devon, former, and Booker is the former president of WASCO, West Hartford African American Social and Cultural Organization, and the West Hartford Board of Ed for their vision. Today, we will continue to recognize and give voice to other enslaved individuals who were once in this community. Giving witness, that is, to prove, to provide testimony, to give evidence, to see, that is what this project allows. For if we aren't aware of our past, then we will miss how it connects to the present with so many of the systemic issues that we're faced with today. Discrimination, disparities, and disenfranchisement, thus hindering us from having a more equitable future. Our past informs our present, and our present informs our future. Let us continue to bear witness. Today, I will place the stone of Neptune, a man who helped to build this community and who toiled and lived on what is now New Britain Avenue. He was enslaved by Thomas and Hepziba Seymour, 
and we think he was born around 1740. In 1767, Neptune was valued in Thomas Seymour's inventory at 50 pounds. He was enslaved with a man named Sam. Although we don't know the exact date, we think he died around 1790 when he would have been in his 50s. We know that Neptune would have known one of the first elected black governors, London, who was also enslaved by Thomas Seymour. We wonder, would Neptune have gained status from knowing London? We have evidence that Neptune was hired out to other enslavers, John Skinner and David Seymour, both relatives of Thomas and Hepziba. We wonder, what, parent, what percentage of those wages did Neptune keep? We wonder, did Neptune have a family? We wonder, what skills did Neptune possess that were valued not just by his enslavers, but also by others? Now we will honor Neptune. Westy, and I was a student at Bristow Middle School in Miss O'Mardian's social studies class. Sori and I wrote this poem together. Today I will place the stone of a young boy we studied whose name we do not know, who was only two years old when he died. I will read the poem I wrote, we wrote entitled Hidden Identity. Child, you are gone but not forgotten. You lived a young, short life of barely two years. Nonetheless, it brought meaning and awareness to many. Mother and father unknown, we are now left to piece together the, the puzzle. I keep wondering, what was your name? How did your family share their love? Surrounded by so many people, you deserved happiness. We'll never know your aspirations. Child, you are gone, but not forgotten. Given a value, 10 pounds, valued like an animal, lazing and grazing on the grass. Having a home that is not welcoming, wealthy property, but not yours. I wonder how the grieving came to an end, if a proper burial was not allowed to mend. When I think of you, of you I think of the farm tool you were classified as. I believe that the slaveholder's job was to keep you in check. Instead, they chose to neglect. Child, you are gone, but not forgotten. My name is Zella Jackson. In my eighth grade year at King Philip Middle School, we studied colonial slavery, specifically slavery in the West Division of Hartford. The team I was on studied the stories of enslaved people, Mother Dinah and Daughter Dinah. Both Dinahs were enslaved by the Whiting and Lord family in West Hartford, around the place where Hall High School is located today. Doing this research on these enslaved people I thought was so critical because it really gave a voice to the voiceless, humanized those who had been exceedingly dehumanized, and honored the stories of those whose stories may have not been known. These things show the power of this project and this unit as a whole. While doing my research, I learned how vital it is to acknowledge the many dehumanizing aspects of slavery that happens where I live, such as Mother Dinah getting passed down from generation to generation through wills, never gaining her freedom. This allowed me to understand the significance of slavery and how it continues to impact the systems that are in place in Connecticut today. Today I will place the stone of Dinah, the mother, who lived and toiled on North Main Street. We wonder, was Dinah born in Africa in 1711? We wonder, what name did Dinah's mother give her? We wonder, did she learn to read after she was baptized? We wonder, did Dinah raise her daughter Dinah? We wonder, did Dinah set aside any special things for her daughter before she died? Hello, my name is Grayson Rivers. I was a student at King Philip and in Miss Lewis's history class. I studied Dinah. Dinah was not one person, but two, a mother and a daughter of the same name. Dinah Sr. and Dinah Jr. were enslaved by the White, Whiting family. Dinah Sr. lived from 1711 to 1761 
and Diana Jr. lived from 1750 to 1800. Diana Sr. was enslaved to Jerusha Whiting's mother, Abigail Woodridge, before being passed down or sold to her and her husband, John Whiting. Diana and her daughter have no other family records and only ever seem to have each other. Both Dinas were baptized and became members of the church. As women, they most likely worked in the house and made, prepared, and cleaned textiles. Working in the house did allow them to do less backbreaking work than the male enslaved workers, but, they were, but there were specific downsides to being a female enslaved person that the other enslaved people didn't experience. Diana Jr. was priced at 25 pounds more than the enslaved males because she was expected to bear children at as young as 16. And although, sadly, Diana Sr. died from a seizure in 1761, Diana the daughter was freed in 1791 and never showed up in any form of documentation again. Although the concept of colonial slavery is not at all new to me, seeing enslaved people as individuals is. I am more used to thinking of enslaved people as a group, all having similar experiences and sharing the same emotions and feelings. But I realized, even among those enslaved under the same family, they were different, and even those related to each other had, diff had different experiences. Dinah the mother's experience was different from her daughter's because she was never freed, nor was she able to live to see freedom for her daughter. Looking at enslaved people as actual individuals was crucial for a better understanding of them as a group. Looking at them with names and families humanizes them, which is why, we, which is why it is so important to focus on just a couple of people before bringing your gaze back to the enslaved people everywhere. Today, I will place the stone of Dinah's daughter, who at about the age of 40 was freed in 1791. Good morning, my name is Gail Crockett, and this spring I participated in both Witness Stone's community classes. Today I will place the stone of a woman named Liddy, who we believe was born in Africa and trafficked here. Liddy had a young child born into slavery who died in 1766. In that same year, she was valued at 16 pounds, or the equivalent of $22 in today's U.S. currency, um, in John Whiting's inventory. She lived with at least nine other enslaved people. During her almost 70 years, she was enslaved by two families, John and Joshua Lord Whiting and Daniel Skinner. Liddy was free before she died around 1800. We wonder, did Liddy tell her stories about Africa to younger people who were enslaved? We wonder, how did her young son die and did she have other children? Thank you. I'm Maggie Roberts. I participated in the Community Witness Stone classes, and today I will place the stone of Chloe Foster Halsey. Her life is a story of disentanglement from the institution of slavery. Chloe was born into slavery in Glastonbury in 1777, and we discovered that she was baptized as an infant. Chloe, along with her seven siblings, were enslaved by Timothy Hale of Glastonbury, her father, Peter, while fighting in the Revolutionary War, was trafficked to Daniel Hare, Hale in Glastonbury. Chloe's father later bought his freedom with earnings from his service in the American Revolutionary War. In 1801, according to the Hartford Kingsbury census, we know Chloe was free and married Ransom Halsey in 1802. Chloe and Ransom toiled on Ashbell's well, Ashbell Wells Farm near Albany Avenue. We discovered in the 1840 cen census that Chloe and Ransom moved to Green County, New York. She died sometime prior to 1850. We wonder, what did Chloe's father, Peter, tell her about freedom? 
We wonder, did Chloe and Ransom feel more of a sense of freedom being 250 miles away from where their enslavers lived? My name is Carl Johnson. I graduated from Conard High School, and Dr. Wilson was my teacher. Uh, I became a history teacher at Farmington High School, and currently am the principal at Plainville High School. This spring, I participate in the Witness Stones community class. Today, I will place the stone of Ransom Halsey, who was born into slavery but spent most of his life as a free person. He was freed in 1801 at about the age of 20. He then married his wife, Chloe Foster, in 1802. He lived and toiled with Chloe on the Ashabel Wells farm on Albany Avenue. He was a skilled farmer and contributed to the success of Ashabel Wells farm. He is one of the few enslaved people we have researched that has a surname and a record of his marriage and residence in two US census records. We wonder, how did Ransom and Chloe disentangle themselves from slavery? We wonder, did Ransom and Chloe have a family? Thank you. We are pleased to welcome Frederick Douglass Knowles III, Hartford's inaugural poet laureate, to our ceremony. An educator and activist, he sees the literary arts as a way to build community and support for, uh, for activism. He has many literary awards, including being selected as a finalist for Poet of the Year Award by the New England Association of Teachers of English, a two-time Pushcart Prize nominee, the Nutmeg Poetry Award, and the, the 2020 Connecticut of the Arts Fellow in Artist Excellence for Poetry and creative nonfiction. Knowles is the author of Black Rose City and a professor of English at the Three Rivers Community College in Norwich. Please welcome him as he performs his poem, Ancestry. Uh, good morning, folks. I'd just like to, um, first and foremost, thank the ancestors for blessing me to be part of this project in this day. Um, I recently was part of the Witness Stone Project in New Haven, Connecticut, which was about a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was uh, hosted by the New Haven Museum and the uh, Foot School. And I had the opportunity to research a sister by the name of Pink Primus, who was uh, enslaved in New Haven. And I'm going to read her poem today that I had wrote for her. It's titled Ancestry, and the subtitle is Shoots of Plants Blooming in Spring for Pink Primus, circa 1791. Her slave master's favorite color was most certainly green. The shade of profit from selling people like property. A secondary color misused to attune the voice in her skin to a second class rainbow bent on mashing molasses. I wonder what her favorite color was. Was it the color of a freedom blue sky or the shimmer of a lake under the sun? Was it the color of a flaring soul, the embers of ancestry fanning the flame of her descendants' dreams? Was it the color of a desert African bush a lioness beige camouflaged by the sandy hue of the Kalahari? Was it the color 
of her stark eyes, dark as a North Star night, or the color of a candle illuminating a train traveling underground? Was it a deep rebel maroon, rich like a warrior's melanin, insurrecting the indigenous resistance to colonialism? Was it the color of matrimony, two crayons coloring in and out the lines of love? Was it the color of emancipation, the color of their land bought by the bank of a dragon, a pasture as green as the evening in the Eden of Ethiopia? Was it the color of pride? strength, courage, charisma, wisdom, conviction, involution, companionship, direction, guidance, purpose, or was it the color of her name, the color of a Mandinka woman, the color of ether, of existence, of a Zulu queen armored in bronze, a matriarch, protector, provider, nurturer, the color of a cornerstone who bore witness to the dawn of a mountain, the color of the bottom of her foot rooted in the soil of American history. No, I believe her favorite color was the color of her daughter. Chloe, Greek, meaning yellow and green. Young green shoots of plants blooming in spring. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Lynn Hayes Thomas, and I attended one of the Witness Stones community classes. Witness Stones is about speaking the name of enslaved people. Oh, can you hear me? Speak to me. Thank you. Witness Stones is about speaking the name of enslaved people who lived in our community and helped build it, all while bound by the chains of slavery. During the class, I was intrigued by the digging required to gain minuscule amounts of information about the enslaved person and how pleased our instructors would be with their discoveries. They were knowledgeable about the times and locales and encouraged our imaginings of these people's lives and thoughts and desires. Witness Stones is an undertaking that began before our current wave of racial reckoning, and I would like to speak the names of the three persons we have been so instrumental in making it happen here in West Hartford. Dr. Tracy Wilson, Elizabeth Devine, and Denise DeMello. Kudos to you all. Today, I will place the stone of Frank, a man who married a biracial woman and had two young children die. I wrote a poem. It is entitled, Eyes, a poem for Frank. When I emerge from the security of that moist, warm tunnel, 
and first saw the eyes of the midwife, they contained relief and foreboding. Then the, other, then the eyes of my mother showed love and foreboding. Those eyes never change, but when I was eight, they overflowed with conclusions foregone and anguished tears as I was whisked away by a new massa. Baptism opened my eyes to prayer and hope. My eyes opened even wider at the sight of Miss Myla Mary, and she looked upon me too. She put laughter and joy and promise in my eyes when she agreed to marry me, the same look I had when I purchased my freedom. Each time her father's name was mentioned, the same man who sold her, her eyes filled with the look of betrayal and hurt and disbelief. Those beautiful eyes of my beloved clouded over once and then a second time with the death of our children. With my eyes open for the last time, I looked into the eyes of God and saw love and acceptance. I closed my eyes and entered a tunnel surrounded by warmth and relief and anticipation with a bright light at the very end. To Frank. On this special day, the two of us have the honor of remembering the legacy of slavery here in West Hartford. Remembering their lives and telling their stories is one way we can celebrate enslaved people's emancipation across our country. We'd like to tell you about Peleg Knott, the man we learned about in Miss McCarthy's history class from working with the Witness Stones Project. Peleg was an outlier in his community, making a name for himself among both enslaved and free people at a time where most enslaved people were silenced and kept in the background. Through actively participating in his community, he built a trustworthy reputation and became a symbol of hope, representing what the future could look like. He served in the military as a provisions cart driver during the revolution, bringing supplies to French and American troops, and managed several acres of farmland owned by Jeremiah Wadsworth. Most of us know Mr. Wadsworth as the man the Wadsworth Athenaeum is named after but he was also Mr. Peleg Knott's enslaver. Peleg was also elected to be black governor, serving as a leader in his community. Eventually, he and his wife, Rachel Knott, were freed. Their son, Henry Knott, lived his life as a free man. As an African-American living in West Hartford myself, Peleg's story struck me deeply. I was blissfully unaware of the realities of slavery in my own neighborhood. I began to think of the harsh realities that my own ancestors experienced in their native Georgia. The idea that they were simply treated like cattle pains me. But Peleg's story gave me hope. Hope that my great-great-grandfathers, grandmothers, aunts, and uncles were able to experience something that even slightly resembles control of their own lives. Hope that, like Peleg, they were able to bathe, even for a moment, in the warm rays of happiness. Hope that the fear of being at the end of the sharp crack of the master's whip did not prevent them from enjoying each day. Hope that, like Peleg, they could envision a better future for themselves and their loved ones. Like many figures in history, the storyline of Peleg Knott is not a straightforward one. As Isaiah mentioned, he was an outlier. While we chose to tell a more uplifting story, we also recognize that Peleg Knott was still a part of the millions of people who endured the injustices of slavery and were largely forgotten. Like many of his fellow enslaved people, he does not have a single thing in town to honor him or tell his story. This lack of representation is quite disappointing for a town that enslaved over 70 individuals. Without the contributions of enslaved people, West Hartford would not be all that it is today. To address this shortcoming, one of the goals of the Witness Stones Project is to revise the public history to more accurately reflect the impact of enslaved individuals on our town. Last fall, my classmate Eliza Sadiq and I wrote a letter to the West Hartford Town Council proposing to rename one of the many streets in West Hartford after Pelignot in order to honor him for his resilience, resourcefulness, and leadership. I'll read an excerpt from our letter now. Naming a street after Peleg Knott would be a great first step to securing his legacy and telling the story of slavery in this town. 
In light of this year's events relating to the Black Lives Matter movement, renaming the street would be a way to let the people of the movement know that they are seen and heard and that we are working to right our wrongs for them. After the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, protesters cried for everyone to say their names and recognize their deaths and the injustices that caused them. We would literally be answering their call by saying the name of a subject of racism and putting Peleg's name on the street sign. We cannot continue to ignore this narrative and we must tell Peleg's story. Thank you all for coming. As I look into this sea of faces here to acknowledge the life of a man they never knew, I am filled with hope that by acknowledging our past, we can create a better future for all of us. Today, on the first federally acknowledged Juneteenth, we will place the stone of Peleg Knott, who was elected black governor in 1780, and the stone of his wife, Rachel Knott. Good morning to all of you, my family and humanity, and my ancestors in blood and in spirit. It is a great day for West Hartford. There are so many great Juneteenth commemoration programs going on throughout Connecticut. Shortly I'll be aboard the Amistad replica and mystic with very, very young children who will be learning about their history, their true history, at an early age. Before this morning, I am honored to place the stone of Phoebe, who was born around 1735 and enslaved by Peter, with Peter, by Daniel Merrill on Albany Avenue. In 1750, she was deeded from Daniel Merrill to his son, Jonathan Merrill, in a will. She was forced to move to New Hartford, where she toiled and lived within a community of six Native families and enslaved people until her death, sometime around 1790. We wonder, did Phoebe have her own family? We wonder, was Phoebe freed? We wonder, did the Native families help Phoebe, give Phoebe a place where she could belong. We wonder, was Phoebe related to Peter? Today, we remember Phoebe. Today, I will place the stone of Peter who we believe was born around 1720. Peter was a manservant who was enslaved first by Daniel Merrill on Albany Avenue, and then deeded to Israel Merrill, who lived on Four Mile Hill, which is now New Britain Avenue. Peter attended Reverend Nathaniel Hooker's ordination in 1757. Then in 1760, Peter toiled on Captain Hezekiah Merrill's land. We believe that Peter died around 1780. Today we wonder, did Peter have a family? And we wonder, was he freed before he died? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Certainly want to hear your voices, for we are here for a wonderful, a good cause. We are here giving voice to those that have been voiceless for so long. And we are saying we are not going to do that anymore. Today is more than just an occasion. Today is reminding us of a purpose to drive us forward in a continuous movement for betterment for all. And as we recognize the names of those individuals that have been enslaved in this town, those individuals who helped to make this town what it is. 
that is something that is not only benefiting us here, but it's benefit benefiting generations to come. And so for that, again, I will say good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. We have a wonderful day of festivities taking place today. And what a special way to start with the Witness Stone celebration, Witness Stone ceremony. And as has been shared, when you witness, that means you are seeing. All of you are seeing. And you cannot unsee what you've seen. You cannot unknow what you know. So now the charge is for all of you to continue to be witnesses and to speak up and speak out our truth. There is no shame in West Hartford acknowledging the wounds from our past. There is shame in trying to suppress that. There is shame in trying to rewrite the narrative. We are not doing that. We are speaking our truth. And thank you for bearing witness to the truth telling. Today, I will place the stone of Jack, who was born in 1696, one of the oldest enslaved people we know of who lived here. He lived and toiled on North Main Street as a farmer. We know a lot about Peter's life from church records and probate records. Jack is listed as sick in his enslaver, Captain Joseph Whiting's 1725 inventory. We have records which show that he was cared for by a doctor. According to a church record, Jack was 68 when he died in 1764 from gangrene. We wonder, did Jack have a family? We wonder, how did Jack get better? We wonder, what skills did Jack have that helped to build this community? Those are questions we will ask about Jack and all of those that we have named today. We must not forget. And now I will place the stone of Jack. We bear witness with these memorials to the devastation caused by slavery on individuals, families, and communities. When the mural at Blueback Square um, outside the library is in, unveiled, please be sure to note the names of the 11 enslaved people painted into the mural. Ned, Caesar, Greenville, Simone, Hannibal, Peleg, Dinah, Frank, Jude, Paige, and Lou. Thank you for joining our effort to confront and recover these stories to create a community where there can be equal justice and freedom for all. We invite you now to walk to the town hall behind our drummers for the official beginning of the townwide Juneteenth celebration. And the drummers will start the procession. Thank you.